You're listening to the Light Over Time podcast with David Sargent and Corey Bartos. It is July 27th, 2024. Happy to be here. How are you, David? I'm doing great. I'm uh, huffing some plumber's glue that's been installed in a new drain pipe about four feet that way, maybe eight feet that way. Other than that, I'm feeling good. I guess that's going to make me feel good by the end of this podcast. (laughs) Fair enough. Have you, uh, you drinking any coffee tonight? (laughs) You haven't asked me that in like months and tonight it's water. Of course. That's that's hilarious. So uh, <laughs> my birthday is next Wednesday, and um, my buddy Evan got me a um, like frother device that does cool. hot and cold foam, nice. and we've gotten really bougie lately. Hey. Um, I've been doing uh, basically the ice chicken espresso from Starbucks, but with uh, Strange Matter coffee, and it's delicious. Okay. Um, and then uh, Elle got these like... 24 ounce cups i feel bougie it's delicious it, um and it saves me a lot of money on starbucks i guess if i can ask what is the method to make that drink what's the difference well it's just like um you take brown sugar and you mix oh. it into the espresso when you're uh, like in a tumbler brown add a sugar. bunch of ice and then shake the heck out of it in a tumbler um i then pour it over ice and then we add cold foam on top cool and it's just delicious. And the freaking texture that this stupid Amazon like cold foam thing does is just wonderful. So Maybe I'll try that tonight with some decaf. Yeah, it's delightful. Uh, but yeah, I actually was uh, looking at some of the stuff and I was like, hey, we haven't talked about coffee in a long time. Because no, generally haven't. it was like <laughs> you were making your own coffee and roasting your own coffee. And I was drinking yeah. a bunch of your coffee back then. But anyway. Well, um, actually, got- actually, before we move on, you should ask again soon because um, I got the boss to give me a budget to buy other roasters coffees like once a week or once twice a month or something like that so i will be drinking new stuff frequently nice nice so yeah just getting like the the landscape of the coffee to try to see what's going on and what people are doing i love that yeah that's awesome um well we have a kind of a hectic chaotic show more or less there's a lot kind of going on i've had a little bit of shooting since our last episode um a couple of cameras have been released since or announced released slash that uh, yeah. since the last episode there's some kind of fun rumors but uh i guess we'll jump into if uh you've been shooting or anything how what you've been up to just stuff for work and it kind of makes me sad but work is so dang busy it leaves me just like dead tired for the weekend and i don't know um so i did i actually did a portrait session with my wife lisa um just at the house but we have a sliver of our side yard that gets really nice golden sunset light in the evening. So it must have been from like 7.30 to 8 or something where it was like just burning orange and we stepped outside and did some pictures and got a couple nice shots. I haven't posted them on my socials yet. I probably will at some point, but she has. Um, and then just stuff for work, lots of like close-ups of drinks and things like that. So camera's been busy at work and not much else, but... I really am trying to get back out because one of the things I wanted to do was to use that infrared filter I bought. I haven't used it a whole lot. I used it for a couple of images at Big Pup Falls when I went and did my waterfall stuff like a whole month ago. Uh, But since then, it hasn't been out and I really need to use it because it's best used in the summer and there's not a lot of other um, times of the year, at least here where an infrared filter is helpful for outside at least because it's really good with foliage and in the winter it's basically useless for most applications anyway. So I want to get out and use the infrared filter and I'm, I'm going to try, I might try, I might try tomorrow. I might try tomorrow. Nice. Um, love that. I definitely empathize with the the busyness. It has been pretty chaotic. Um, yeah. I had a guy from another company come up on Wednesday, or he came up Tuesday night, um, and then we had a shoot day at work, which was really fun. Um, it's been a while since I've been able to like work with another creative, um, especially one in my same industry, one that very intimately knows all of my problems. Um, you know, the, the, the day-to-day struggle with the social media stuff with yeah. our industry and stuff like that. So it was, it was really, really helpful as far as like my mentality for creating, um, giving me a nice kick in the pants for like, wow, this guy like really shoots his butt off. Um, he had a, an FX three and then I think an a seven R three, uh, a slightly older body. Um, and we did basically collabed on two videos, did a bunch of photography. Um, it was, it was a lot of fun. Yeah. Um, 
just before that, uh, was that last weekend? It must have been last weekend. Um, the 100th Bayview Mackinac race was happening. I hear and, about that. Yeah, and it's pretty crazy. So uh, I'm from Port Huron, Michigan. That's where I grew up. I don't live there anymore, but um, we're we. I think probably we take for granted a little bit that that's kind of always been a big starting point for that race. So it's a thing that I'm very intimately aware of as long as, as far as being a child, I remember seeing this race like start. Um, what was really cool about this time was my friends Hope and Evan have like uh, a family owned like beach property. And for whatever reason, they moved the starting point uh, a, a few miles and all of the boats, cause there was over 300 this year, which was crazy. Mm. Uh, they started out right out front of their house. Wow. So for like a couple hours, there was just like a fleet of sailboats just kind of hanging out. <laughs> um, so we were grilling and drinking, playing games and, and you know, being in the big lake like you're on. And uh, I snapped some photos of that. We saw some pretty cool birds. Um, I had basically my A7C2 set up and uh, the A7 IV with the 70 to 200 and 2x and then the 200 to 600 um l was shooting the um a7 IV with the 70 to 200 and the teleconverter i was using my 200 to 600 and uh saw a ruby throated hummingbird cool. found some some really cool red bellied um uh woodpeckers um a bunch of different sparrows and things like that but just like at the beach house um That's it was awesome. super nice yeah, we, we went out Friday night um, before pretty much anybody else got there, and we woke up super early and just kind of moseyed on outside, had a couple like early morning drinks, and was just like vibing, burden. Um, she and I have been out a few other times since then, um, between that and the last episode and now, and uh, really, really is super stoked about like the autofocus of the mirrorless stuff. and. Yeah. Like going from that, that it was actually a 50 to 500 Sigma, which is crazy. Um, an old F or EX, whatever it is, lens with that Canon to running the Sony stuff is she's like hooked. Absolutely <laughs> loves it. Went from like just using the camera to kind of verify things and get some snaps for Berta to like full on wants to be shooting better photos of birds, which is awesome. Nice. Um, I'm not sure what I'm going to do. So this is the kind of gear part. Um, the A6700 is pretty freaking cheap, especially with my discount. I think I can get it for like 1100 bucks. And the extra reach plus the 26 megapixels, all of the autofocus updates might be plenty for what she wants, um, what she needs really. And I'm considering getting one soon. Um, I'm thinking I might try to get a evaluation copy and see how it is um, because there's that new there's uh, allegedly a new Sony Alpha camera coming out this year and at that part at that point I would just have her use my A7C2 so it's hard to want to you know spend another lot of money yeah. on another body just uh, just cause um, but a part of me does want her to have her own kit. Um, I'm I'm still thinking that with the Sigma 100 to 400 would be a really killer, relatively compact, not tiring setup to to run. Um, but yeah, hmm. I gotta kind of try and get some my hands on some of them. Um, I'd like to see if Norman Camera in Kalamazoo has that Sigma. I'd like to put my hands on it and see how heavy it really feels and put it on a body. But uh, that's that's been fun. Um, Good. I I can't even describe how awesome it is to be able to like regularly shoot, and uh, yeah, so that's been fun. That's been like kind of what we've been up to. That's awesome. Yeah, the only other recreational shooting I've done also is just some birds. We we I have a trail just outside of the building that I roast most of my stuff, uh, most of my coffee for work, and so I, I can go across the street and it's like this tiny little segment of a biking trail. Um, and every day that I'm there, this little goldfinch pops out. <laughs> You've probably seen it on my stories. Pops yeah. out from those woods and just comes to hang out with me on the little uh, maple tree that's outside the building. And uh, I get to see it. I'll like take my phone out and spy on it for a second, and then it's gone back in those woods. So I've yeah. been trying to go back in there. There's a bunch of downy woodpeckers in there. Uh, I've run into a couple of deer in there. Um, but I really want to get like a really nice 
goldfinch shot because yeah. i only have like one good one from many years ago and i just i don't know it's just a beautiful bird you know it stands out it's it's one of my favorites i don't have a great shot of one yet um i've captured them but yeah. they're neat because they I'm, I'm to the point where when uh me or l hear it we know it's a goldfinch yeah and yeah. uh especially when it's far off often it does these little like it'll flap its wings really hard and then kind of glide and it does like yeah. the these like big cloudy looking dips like it's just moseying it's yeah. such a like fun little bird to watch um but yeah i a full full send on birding has been fun birda is really really rad yeah um, i need to use it more um i i i'm glad i was shown it by my coworker, and she doesn't use it ever either she just told me it, it existed and i was like why hasn't this been around longer because ebird and merlin the combo of those two apps are functionally great but there's no social aspect really like in yeah. ebird you can you can see who's tagging what but there's no interaction right. and so there's this almost gamified social media aspect to birda that i i do i do enjoy it's not yeah. um it's not a chore to use right and and it's just fun like i like to um it, it was what I wanted from Ebird and Merlin mm -hmm. that they didn't do well. It's yeah. the other, because like we still use Merlin, uh, I'll still use Ebird, but I wanted to be able to go in, see my life list, yeah. click on a type of bird, and then see the photos that I've posted from posts from that bird. And it does exactly that, which yeah. is super awesome. Um, it's, I'm like in between, originally I was only going to post like my banger birds. Like I wasn't going to count a bird unless i got like a pretty nice photo of it yeah and now there's like some slightly harder to capture birds that if i get like an okay one but it's very definitively that bird i'm like ah, i'm gonna post it like right we were chasing this freaking eastern peewee for like weeks we heard it <laughs> a bunch of times this tiny little bird and i finally got it like through the freaking all these sticks all backlit by the sun and i was like ah, i got it so i was like don't <laughs> don't care i'm putting it on there i'm putting it on there and that's um, fair because you can always post it again later. It'll right. be there. Yeah, yeah. Right. Um, but I am I am pleased with it. Uh, we were after the Mackinac um, race weekend uh, when we were heading back. We were asking Evan's dad, who's been a birder for you know decades. Um, like he has old manuals that he's checked off his birds. Oh, and sweet. Like he, he's been into it for a really long time. He used to he took a class uh, way back in the day where they like did field trips to like go do birding and stuff. It was really cool. He was telling us about. But he knows all the areas where we where I grew up, and uh, he recommended a spot. We went and saw. I literally was having a conversation with him. I was like, "Oh, it'd be really cool to see a turn in uh, Michigan, and then it'd be really cool to see Osprey because I see them all the time in uh, Maryland." And then we saw both. We saw like eight Osprey, like kind of hunting. I was trying to find the water that they were eight at. Different Osprey. Yeah, they were just wow, like vibing, cool. dude. It was awesome. And then uh, that, this Caspian turn, I really wanted to see the Osprey hunt, but they were just past where I could get to, and they were just like really soaring around and stuff. We got some great photos of them, but uh, nothing of them actually getting any food. And then we're like, okay, well, we should probably go. We got, you know, like a two hour drive to get home. And on our way back around the pond, or this lake kind of, um, this Caspian turn rolls up, and they're so fun to watch. They like fighter pilot down, and d have I talked about this on the show already? Or no, I don't think so. Okay, well, I, I'm telling this story. I've told this story already, and I was like, I hope I didn't like already talk about uh -uh, all of no. this. Um, but we haven't had an episode since then, so I guess it doesn't make sense. But anyway, um, it was really cool to see. Like he'll fake out, um, he'll like go upside down, dive straight towards the water, and then just like go nope, and like bail. Yeah, we're watching that, and then I see him just smoke a freaking blue, uh, bluegill right out of the water, and I was like, "Yes, this is what I wanted." And you know what's great about turns is, unlike the kingfisher, where it's so elusive most times, the turn is persistent. So if it doesn't get a fish, it'll go back yeah. again and again and again, and it'll often hit the same spots. And you and it gives you a couple of seconds of anticipation time preparation because you can see it kind of pause before it goes down, and you yeah. know when it's about to dive. And if it commits, it's pretty like like you're pretty sure where it's going to land and how it's going to happen and if he comes up with a fish you'll be prepared so like they're a yeah. really good subject for trying to get that kind of shot they're fun it, 
they're great for practice. Yeah. Uh, like birds in flight, he basically did like you could count four points on the lake. He would go from one end to the other corner to the other corner and back. And he did it probably three full times, three full That's rotations awesome. around the lake. Probably did nine to 12 dives, a couple fake outs, but some a couple unsuccessful full dives and then one where he like comes out with a big bluegill and I was like that was so much fun and such a great way to end you know a session because this you know now Elle's already on the Sony so she's also getting incredible shots at this bird yeah and it was just it, we walked away from it being so happy because there is there were some finches and some other cool birds as well but the the osprey and the um the uh turn was kind of the the thing um Saw a willow flycatcher, which was pretty cool. Oh. Elle missed it, which was unfortunate. Oh. Um, because they're a little elusive and pretty quiet for the most part. Um, but what was really funny, another thing like, uh, with my mentality for posting on Berta, um, I see it because she heard it on Merlin and it was like, there's a, there's a willow flycatcher around here. And then I see it go on like a reed and it like, it like boings. And I'm starting to shoot it. I make sure I get a shot. And I'm like, oh, it's right there. The tree, <laughs> right at the bottom. It's over there. But then a runner is behind us. Uh-oh. And is running towards the flycatcher. And instead of, like, not doing anything, L just zoomed out and shot in that general direction. <laughs> <laughs> not a good shot at all. But, like, enough to go, that's the bird. It's there. And then, yeah, okay. And then here's Corey's shot to confirm what nice. the bird is. Perfect. And I was like... I was like, that's whack, but it counts. You it saw counts. it, you heard it on Merlin, and you did get it with your camera. Because she won't post my shots. She's kind of competitive, so she's like, wow, if I didn't see it, I didn't see it. I didn't get the bird. Oh, I'd be the same way, um, absolutely. So it's so it's been really, really freaking fun. That is great. Um, one thing that I learned about the camera that I don't like, I'm starting to get used to not having a joystick. So yep. that's that's been mostly overcome. But uh, I'm really left-eye dominant. And the uh, downside to the rangefinder setup is I need to use the EVF with my left eye, but with an A7 IV, something that has the like fake prism yeah. um, top, I can keep both eyes open yeah. and kind of know where I'm pointing, and I can't do that with the A7C2. And I was like really struggling to, even with like the turn, it was really yeah. hard for me to keep my lens where I'm going um without being able to open my eye and i was starting to like kind of cock my head a little yeah. bit so i could try to get my eye over it and it's just that's really brutal that does suck and that's not a like a i like or don't like this thing it's not a subjective thing that's like a functional utility thing you're affected by that's unfortunate right. yeah i mean if if you know for right eye dominant people it's probably awesome because then the whole left side of your face yep. is completely away from the yeah camera. i never had that issue but I'm super, super left eye dominant. It's I'm right handed and I, I shoot firearms left handed because of my left eye dominance. Uh like using red dots and stuff. It's that bad. It's really, really wow. strong. So like it's not really an option to use my right eye, both eyes open with the camera, because then I'm basically only seeing with my eye and I'm not really retaining right. information from the EVF. Um, which I think is something that like not a lot of people talk about very regularly but i don't think like the average person really kind of has that understanding of the, the eye dominance i have it because of shooting so often um with mm. firearms um but it was it's why i probably will like use other cameras over the a7c if i'm doing birding yeah i totally um, get it yeah uh, otherwise i'm really loving it i love the 24 f28 um, tiny little lens. It's it's been a lot of fun. Um, I've snapped a lot of photos with it, both for work and just for the heck of it. And yeah. uh, it's it's pretty cool. The it's very clear that the autofocus upgrades from the A7 IV to the A7 C2 are like pretty pretty much a big deal. Man, nah. um, yeah. And if I could say something about that, because I remember a couple of weeks ago we were talking about like the Nikon Z63, and I was like giving it some serious thought. And you said that I should shoot Nikon. I should I should go and try the Nikon. And every, I don't know, every day I was thinking about it and I was digging like research. Like I was like in forums looking at what people thought if they switched from Sony to the Z63 specifically or even the ZF. And it made me realize, yeah, I do a lot of birding, but there's a lot more I do um, in general. And... It's like one of those niche, super performance-reliant things where 
even going to the Z6 III, I don't think I was going to see enough of an improvement with whatever lens I could afford to get on that system to to admit to like say to myself like oh this was totally worth the jump i don't sure. i couldn't convince myself i was going to get there and i didn't want to do all that work and then be left with less lenses or like lenses that i wasn't as happy with because i love the sigma 50 i love the sony 20 um you know i just wasn't completely there with it after i did all that research and yes the z63 fantastic camera pretty much all around didn't really care about those dynamic range issues whatever the autofocus is great i'm sure but for all the other stuff i do at work it's like fantastic like iaf on just regular subjects perfect shooting yeah. with lisa it's like the, the easy stuff of course the non-niche stuff it is a yeah. perfect camera otherwise yep. um you know the s cinetone for doing stuff like this and other little things at work uh i have 120 you know it's like everything else about the camera being so rounded as it is even though it's a little older now yeah and we might be seeing an a7 5 soon um it was just really like unless i'm going to like one of the high-end cameras i yeah. just wasn't gonna see it and maybe with the new ai chip i will see it like the a6700 like you said between the two um i would love to have an ai chip for af but it just wasn't there for me so i, I don't sure. know I I gave it a lot. I see some serious. I gave it a lot of serious thought because I was a hair away from just selling it and switching to Nikon, and just didn't get quite over that hump. Yeah, no, I think that's completely reasonable. Um, I made a, a little quick reel in my car last week um, yeah. talking about the uh, would be A seven five, and had a couple of friends reach out and was like, man. Like it's just such a shame because I just like got I just got an A seven four and I stuff. think I saw then, that comment in that yeah yeah and and we DM'd a little bit um uh my a couple of my friends and a couple other people that saw it and like the A seven four for like if if they were to make the A seven five really really solid give it the new screen give it maybe that thirty six megapixels or whatever if they can make it like really really awesome and super compete with the um the z63 cool but if they were to drop they, they kept the a7 III around for a long time so if they yeah. have the the a7 IV drop down to like 1800 bucks that 17 like 58 or whatever that weird price is that's an incredible camera for sub yeah. 2k yes and people are going to keep buying it for a good long time yeah because for like 99 percent of the stuff it's always going to crush yeah um i definitely want more than 10 fps that's brutal um you can't really go from 10 fps to 120 and then be like this is fast enough like i would take like 14 like i'm i'm just saying like literally a few more frames a second i think would be huge yeah um yeah. and then i'd like to i'd like to not have a crop in 4k 60 anymore um but outside of that i think that would be pretty much the camera for me um yeah and what's unfortunate about that is i don't think those things are enough for everybody, but they're enough for you, right? No. And they'd be enough yeah, for me yeah. too. Um, so I don't know. I, I it, it would be difficult for me to see what they could come up with that would make me happy enough. If they, if all those things, yeah, sure, I'd probably be on the same thing, and I'd probably upgrade as well. And yeah, I, you, this A7 IV, you could probably still get two grand for right now on its own. Um, I just checked, and I've got 51,000 shots on mine, which isn't too terrible. So I, I definitely could. I've got no cosmetic, you know, nothing. I, when I was thinking about selling, I was really thinking about it. Like, yeah. I price matched. I had um, uh, I put everything up on uh, um, uh, one of those sites, not not B and H, Adorama, and I had one of the guys reach out to me because I didn't realize that uh, is even if you get the like online quote, they're gonna like contact you and like send yeah, you a label yeah. and stuff. So I was like, oh, sorry, I wasn't quite there yet. I just wanted to see what you would offer. Um, and it was, you know, it was fine. But yes, if if those just those things came for me, that'd be enough too. But I think they're gonna yeah. have to do a little more to match the Z six three to for compete. Sure. Yeah, it's gonna be a really really tough nut to crack. Like uh, um, going into the next thing a little bit, like seeing where all the companies are in their like various levels of camera. Yeah. Um, there's, I think the gaps have widened between like the pros and cons of all three systems. Um, they were all kind of just pretty good. Like everything was pretty decent. Yeah. And then now like 
the on the lower end, like if you had no kit, super hard not to recommend a Z six three if you're a hybrid shooter. Yeah. Um on on the higher end, it's really hard if you're like sports wildlife like crazy, it's really hard not to recommend like the A nine three because it's incredible. It like is absolutely insane. And then these Canon cameras. <laughs> So I I'm gonna let you start with your thoughts on them because I I haven't I haven't like really 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 deep dove but obviously I was paying attention to them and it was really perplexing I was left very confused <laughs> I think everybody is um, yeah the most confusing thing to me is that they made the R five two so good that I think that's gonna cannibalize a lot of the R one because the R one seemingly doesn't do enough of what people expected people expected an everything a master of everything camera right because right. that's where we're at now like z9 45 megapixels fast as hell very good autofocus as, as good as nikon gets which is pretty much right there with the competition we, we really can't say nikon's a whole lot worse than anybody right now um and even the A1, right? Like the A1's got, what is it, 50 megapixels, fast as hell. Right. So where was that? And why is the R1 not the R3 Mark II? Right. What is that's, that? <laughs> that's the thing. That's the really crazy thing. Because you go, okay, um, the R3, this is like a couple of firmware upgrades from, and like I, I believe the sensor's completely new. But otherwise, most of the specs that the R3, one has as of the the pre-released versions that a lot of people are talking about um it it's not outperforming the r3 in a lot of stuff it's there's a weird. couple of like really niche features like that are absolutely improved but as far as like price to those features it's not three grand of features it's not an entire other camera and then people i don't actually know i think somebody was telling me that you can't really get a R3 price on like the main. So forty four ninety nine. Yeah. For the R3. Yeah. Which is that's with the instant savings right now. It's four grand. It's three thousand nine hundred ninety nine dollars, and it's ninety two percent of the R1. Yeah. Um, and the thing that was really perplexing, like the big ticket thing, is that C log two which is Canon's absolute best log profile. It's on the R1. But I feel like it could have been firmware upgrade for the R3. I don't know why, like, it's not like- I agree. That sensor's incapable of doing C-Log2. But then, I, I guess I'm just really, really confused at what their move is because that means that's $2,300 more for C log two and some niche slightly, software features and then a slightly better sensor. But the R one based off of the processing for the, the autofocus and stuff, it should be able to do full width like 120, and it doesn't. It should be able to like down sample all of its stuff, all of its freaking video features should be bomb proof. And it as of right now, it's not. So that'll be the, the real crux. I think if they final production version has completely downsampled like 4K or maybe 6K or whatever they're doing with it, if that's going to be really, really rock solid in C-Log2, that camera will be bought. But only then. If you're getting 4K 120 downsampled, which I think the chip should be capable of, then the, the really high-end guys will still buy it. But otherwise... The um, when we were speaking, I thought that these sensors were just as fast as all the other ones. They're not just as fast as uh, some of the competition, but they are decently fast. They're better than the R5 one. It sounds like they're three millisecond. They're they're like they're fast. Yeah. But the R5, I I don't know who's gonna take the R1 over the R5 unless they like big production, and they really need C log too. Yeah, it's it's very strange to me. Uh, you, it almost feels like, well, obviously it's the better value, but it almost feels like it's got more to offer too. 
it's very strange um there's like the ai upscaling feature in both of those cameras uh obviously given to the r1 because it doesn't have as big of a uh resolution but who like who's 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 really using that right like maybe some wildlife shooters maybe but if you're buying an r1 you're probably also buying some of the best glass there is to offer right? right So I don't, I just don't get it. <laughs> I don't uh, get it. No, I, and like, maybe we never will. And and I have in my notes, I guess I'm just poor. Like, <laughs> yeah, well, that too. <laughs> you know, like maybe people just don't care. And, but it, it 1000% feels like the R3 should have just been the R1 and this should be the R1 Mark II. Yes. Yeah. And it, nobody would have bad an eye. Cause if the R3 came out as the R1, I don't think anybody would have been confused or mad. It it was expe- like people were like, why is this not the flagship? This performs like one. It has right. the specs like one. Where what was like when that released? At least that was like, what is this camera if not a flagship? Yeah, it was almost so, like this mystery, you know. And it, it's it's and Canon just came out and said like the R three line is not dead. So there's right. supposedly a successor to the R three as well. Why the separation here? Yeah. Well, and who knows? Because if they do an R3C or something like that, and they make one be really cinema focused, maybe that's a yeah, thing. Yeah, sure. Um, okay, sure. Uh, I could see them doing that with the R1, but I didn't suspect it would happen with the R3. Right. Um, I I'm just I'm confused at like the value proposition, and like for the whole system, like for the R system, and I'm confused about why they're like really doubling down on their software for their lenses. Um, I watched a video on the new 3514 hybrid lens or whatever they call it, um, which is their most recent L lens. And they're making these lenses that are like hybrid because they're supposed to be great for video and stuff. But the the Komodo X, the red Komodo X runs an RF mount. You can have it with an RF mount. Yeah. And on the Komodo X, I was watching some guy had the new 35 and it's the most distorted thing I've ever seen. Oh, so they're, they're building their lenses completely around using like corrective software to make them function. And that's also confusing to me. I was like, is that why they're not going to let people like third party their lenses? Um, Hmm. because like at that point, would a sigma just the way it is with like no distortion at 50 mils or 35 mils would that just make their l lens basically useless maybe that's the case that's crazy yeah but i was like okay yeah i don't have enough information but it was interesting it's just like the r52 the r1 the r3 they're all a little bit more than the competition they're more expensive. They're behind on a lot of like basic features. They have a couple of niche features which are really cool. I'd love to try the eye focus. The, the action the priority AF on the R1 too sounds yeah. really interesting. Yeah, some of those elite features are pretty cool. I really like the eye control autofocus. Yeah. I think it seems And that's sick. a Mark II version. They upgraded that apparently from the first in the right. R3. Right. And it seems cool so long as it works with your eyes or whatever. Right, but, right. Like, uh, could you imagine like fast small birds if you're just looking at the thing and it's like like right. it'd be crazy <laughs> somebody I, this was brought up in the i think the waveform podcast uh mkbhd does and they they didn't really know much about the camera but they brought this feature up and they were all talking about it and somebody uh one of them says well what if you're like really a stickler for comp uh for your composition and you're like always looking in your foregrounds and backgrounds just like checking your composition as you're shooting and it got me thinking like oh yeah i i do like i use foreground and background elements all the time what what does happen does it rack back and forth back and forth because you're checking everywhere do you like what what really does happen in that scenario maybe it's really only intended for locking on to a subject that moves around you know sure but, yeah yeah I, I imagine that you wouldn't always want it for all the cases i'd be no, curious so so i run all my um i i actually use the um autofocus hold on my sony lenses all the time um 
which I, I don't know if they have that button on the lenses of the camera or of the, the Canon lenses, but if they had it on the body, I could see that completely avoiding that issue. Um, yeah. Being able to like temporarily press a button and hold it, and then it just doesn't change the autofocus and look around and then let go and you're back to it. Sure. Um, that'd be really fast and super intuitive. Um, I'm also curious, is it a mix of tracking, like subject tracking, and like does it use your eye to find a subject and then lock onto that subject so that is it's sticky to that subject regardless of where you look slightly around it? I'd love to just try it out. Right. Like, again, because I, I haven't, and I don't know that people have said, but I could imagine it being like you see the box where you're looking, but if you press your wow back button autofocus or your half press, then it locks. Like, then it gets sticky. Sure. Um, cause something that like that sense. Would, that would also be really dope. Like, that would be incredible. Anyway, that's the coolest thing other than, like, I guess the stabiliz- the stabilization is finally better than it was in the R5 at launch, which is horrendous. <laughs> yeah. Um, and the C-Log 2, but um, yeah, I don't know. I think it's crazy. They're opening up their APS-C line stuff for Sigma lenses and things like that. Yeah. But what if you're an R8 user? Do you just only use old EF glass? Because like, who in the hell is going to buy like a $1,500 full frame and then just go get like a freaking 50 F1.2? You, you know, like it seems there's a gap, perhaps. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. But, yeah, it, it, there definitely is room for third parties in there, and they, I, they must know this. I don't know what they're waiting for, other than the fact that you said, if they're designing their lenses such that a third party could come in and optically be far superior right off the bat, maybe they know this. Right. Well, I mean, again, we've been saying for a long time, Sigma is basically. A first party, third party manufacturer. Yeah. Like they're essentially just as good as anything yeah. else. Um, and then, barring... of course, maybe they do feel less threatened on APSC. But then again, I mean, I don't know. But do you think they're selling more crop bodies like they would in the DSLR days? Because they're now it seems a... like there's. Go ahead. They're selling a ton in Asia. In Asia. Maybe Canon that's sells the case. A so they sell a ton of Canon um, APS-C bodies in Asia, as far mm. as the market share data is concerned. Um, here, maybe not so much, but uh, a lot of the time I'm seeing the data, it's usually either world or just the Asian market. Because I don't um, know about you, but it definitely feels to me like there's been a major shift in what produces and what sells and who gets targeted uh, between DSLR days with like Rebels and T t5s t3s whatever those cameras were lots of crop bodies that were very capable in the day and now like what the options are and where they seem more focused seems different in full frame so i don't know if they feel just less threatened by letting sigma on to aps-c and not full frame for that reason well i really do think it would just sell those bodies um the sure r10 the r10 rules yeah it's a really solid camera um and i can only imagine like if this if this happened over a year ago the first lens i would have told my mother to buy would be the 18 to 50 f28 sure um it's very tiny and it's it's a pretty good lens um yeah. i've seen a lot of images from it on like a6700s and stuff and it's it's sharp as heck it's exactly you know sigma treats their contemporary line for apsc just as well as they treat their full frame contemporary yeah. line like they're decent lenses yep um but who knows again um we're not super deep in the industry as far as like what the marketing side of these companies is doing, but um, outside perspective, it is very confusing. And it like, if I lost all of my gear in the lake today and I needed to, you know, make an insurance claim and get a new kit, they're like the last major company that I'd go to. I think hmm. there's just there's not like a huge value proposition. Um, yeah. With that said. I'm very curious to see where Sony Sony goes. Um, the the A1 is long in the tooth. I actually have a rental for it um, set up for September. Ah. Um, I'm gonna get the A1, and I'm gonna get, I'm going to get the 50 f1 too um, for two weeks in September. You know, speaking of the A1, um, Doug Mills using the A1, I realized does not have pre shooting. Right. So in that image with the bullet flying past 
uh, he was just prepared. He was yep. just shooting. Yep. That's incredible to me. Yeah, it's wild. Well, and then, like I said, I think uh, my main concern was uh, if it was fast shutter speed and it was an A93, it would have been locked a lot more. It wouldn't have stretched across the screen at all because um, that global shutter would have got it in an instant. Yeah, right. Um, so that was the main reason why I didn't think that was an A93. Um, speaking to that, uh, interestingly enough, I think I saw it on Sony Alpha Rumors, um, inside the White House in the Oval Office during um, Biden's recent address, all of the cameras inside of there were Sony. Yeah. That's crazy. Yeah, wow. Like, freaking professionals are using their stuff. I was listening to um, Fro's interview with Ev uh, Evan Vucci. It's a very good yeah. interview, by the way. I'm almost done with it. Uh, and he rocks two A93 bodies, both with 2470s and 70 to 200s on them. Uh, I found that fascinating. And he asked him a, a particular question I, to which the answer I thought was very interesting too. Regarding the speed of the A93 being so incredible, he locks it down to like six frames per second. Yeah. So he was shooting those images at at that rally at six fps <laughs> right. i think it's just it's just incredible and, and it's a testament to his skill and his experience yeah of course um like i said when i tried the 120 like twice and was like well that's not useful and unless like i absolutely right now need 120 which you can put it on like a fast button to just yeah. like hold it and turn it into 120 um but for birds i locked it down below 30. Sure. um what's really nice also about that camera is it's on a physical dial so you can set your short medium high and i think high plus you can set those ranges and just click it physically cool so that's that's like awesome because yeah. if you're like okay i'm just like shooting the family um just hanging out with like dogs and stuff you're like i don't need any more than six like i don't need any more than 10 um <laughs> and yeah and it was just pretty wild um Pretty wild. <laughs> That's pretty much all I got to say about the uh, that stuff. But uh, what what do you have uh, that you're looking forward to coming up? You got anything? Um, nothing particular, but I have my waterfall book in my car pretty much at all times right now. And <laughs> on the weekends, I try when I can. Maybe tomorrow is a day where I go, although I'm kind of overseeing this job that's taking place in my house so I can have a functioning second bathroom but maybe also I should get the kids out of the house while it's being finished so um, I might do that instead of focusing on wildlife with them maybe I'll take the camera out with that infrared lens and either go find a waterfall or just go find some nice uh, foliage to shoot so nothing serious planned um, I am looking forward to uh, setting something up with you in the fall that sounds like yeah. fun and I think we'll we'll have a lot of fun with that it's coming closer than you think, man. It's almost no, August. It is. So I believe we have um, the week, the third week of October blocked off. Ooh, all right. And so if we're going to come up, it's going to be that week. Wow. Um, Pretty colors. So, yeah. Fall colors. Um, I figure we'll get a spot and we'll we'll get some time to shoot together, potentially do a live episode. And then she and I will just probably bomb around the UP when you're doing your thing. Heck yeah. And, uh, yeah, hopefully I'll know more in the next couple of weeks, but I'm going to try to lock it down with work and everything as well and make sure that I'm, uh, I'm all good to go. And she awesome. and I will probably look for a cool Airbnb or something to, um, to, to do that with. So, cool. um, very exciting. Uh, there hasn't been a whole lot of like really crazy stuff online, but I did read this article on, uh, Fuji rumors which was, uh, I didn't know, maybe they said it before this, and this is just the first time I'm looking at it, but apparently an X106 style uh, medium format camera. Whoa. For next year. And that's crazy. So looking at potentially being like a 3.2 um, like a, a um, aperture and a similar field of view, I can't remember what that would be in medium format, but if this is under the price of a Leica Q3, 
they might just be like, oh no, we're high end, medium end. We we run the the fixed lens market. <laughs> I think a lot of people are gonna like that camera. There's gonna be a yeah. lot more people that move to what medium format digital is because of that camera. I don't. It's hard to read them with pricing, although they've been really good at making medium format as accessible as they can, given right. the lack of competition. They didn't have to price the other medium format cameras they have the way that they have, right. which is great. Um, and if it accepts the same lenses, and I'm sure it would, why wouldn't they? What a what an incredible proposition. Right. I would I mean, love to see it. I don't know if I would ever get one, but I would love to see it. There's a, I mean, there's, there's a, there's a spot in my backpack for a camera like that. It's got an allure. I, That's I, 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 admit. I love the focal length. I love the fixed lens ideology of it. And when they made the, the GFX 102 or whatever, um, like 7,500 instead of 10 grand, that's like, that's a leap. They could have made that camera $9,000 and people would have been stoked. Sure. Um, I feel like, right? Like they're like, okay, yeah, the last one was 10 grand. We'll go with $9,000. Yeah. Um, you would think it would go the other way with, you know, the inflation and all that stuff, all the things that people complain about. So, yeah, I, I'm really excited to see what that is. I'm excited to see what that does to the industry. Yeah. I'm excited to see how hype that gets or if it doesn't. If well, it's like, incredible to me. They play, they're, they're really playing the long game on this because they could have given up on it. They, you yeah. know, um, they could have. Clearly, there are some people buying it. I don't know why, like you said, down to $7,500. Maybe they are playing such a long game that they've invested in bigger assembly production and they just got to run with it to try to recoup or something. But the fact that they still are basically the only players in that space other than phase one, whatever, uh, it's incredible. You would think, or I, we would have hoped, we've said this, that maybe Fuji doing this would entice Sony or Canon to do something, something. But no, they're still the only players. Yeah. So if they're going to make it, they're going to be the ones to capture anyone who's in the market. <laughs> Right. I mean, come on. They just, they literally made freaking a 500 mil. Yeah. Like, yeah. Wh what? <laughs> <laughs> and it's cool. I don't know that, like, I would go to it as, like, a wildlife thing or anything like that. But if I was already invested in the system, it'd be hard for me not to grab a 500 mil for that right. system. Yeah. Um, because it'd be incredible. Like, think of sports, <laughs> wildlife, whatever the heck. It, it's probably amazing. And I haven't played with those 100 megapixel files in probably two years, but I downloaded a bunch of them. It's remarkable. Sure. Um, it does often, uh, every time I bring up megapixels, I just kind of like faint a little bit because I recently went back and edited a bunch of old uh, <laughs> A7R4 photos, and I badly want those megapixels again. But I have deliberately not looking back on any D850 files almost for that reason it's yeah. it's thick man it's so good the detail is crazy yeah um i was like i was like it's not that it, can, it can't even be sort of that that good <laughs> right like it, like whatever man i i've taken some of my favorite photos i've ever taken with my a7 IV since i've had it and then i was just like oh why <laughs> why, why have i done this it's speaking on that 500 mil for medium format it's interesting right because the idea that someone has the money to drop on ten thousand dollars, let's say, into that system, and then they kind of want to dip their toes into wildlife, you, yeah. you, there's so much better value in just grabbing like an R8, you know, with like a long enough lens to do it. But the crazy thing is, is it's it's a five hundred five six with built-in iOS. OIS. It's true. Oh yeah. True. And it's only 3500 bucks. Yeah, it's true. It's not like it's a $10,000 Prime, but it's a 505.6. No, but you're lacking like the stellar autofocus of some of the other cameras that you could be using a great lens with. And so, you know, it's a trade-off. If you get the shot, it's going to be an amazing shot, right? When you can zoom 20% and it's like <laughs> yeah. you didn't even lose megapixels. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it, I, you know what? I, I just continuously commend Fuji for trying to do something different in that space, especially no one else yeah. is doing it. 
it, I'm sure they're spending a lot of money to do it, but they're making the money. I'm sure it's being subsidized by their X100 line or something, you know? <laughs> right, the camera that nobody can buy. Um, <laughs> if I was Fuji, I would have just made all this hype, and then I would have made a bunch of accounts on Facebook Marketplace, then put a bunch of Fujis up for the 22 to $2,500 <laughs> people are selling them for, yeah. and then just, like, rolled cash. Yeah, right. Um, because, like, what in the hell is wrong with people? I'm... Yeah. I still really wish that I would have just gotten it, but now that I have a few weeks with the A7C2, and it like that body is basically the same price as that whole camera. Yeah. Uh, why I probably would have realistically flipped it for over two grand, like an a-hole, and <laughs> ended up ended up with something else. You know what I mean? Like. Yeah. Yeah. It's just it's so random. People are waiting over a year for that thing. Apparently. Crazy. Yeah. But, I mean, that's all I really have for you today. Yeah. Unless you got anything else you want to talk about. That's it. I think we hit all the things that were top of mind for me. Sweet. Um, I did want to say, I don't know how much participation we'll get, but I'd really love to do a photo share for August. Okay. Um, I'd like to do it for... Uh, I guess basically the end of August, whatever that date is, it'd probably be pretty close to like maybe the the first of September, um, or the week just before it, where we would shoot an episode. Cool. Um, but uh, if you were to put your hand into a hat to choose a topic, I want to put you on the on the freaking hot seat for something <clears throat> a little esoteric. Can we do black and white? I think we could do black and white. I was actually thinking about black and white recently. Um, I was listening to uh, Shifter Media, um, Dan Milner, who basically gave up YouTube recently, talk about people doing books and how unless you're like actually incredible, not only at photography, but telling stories and making books, you just shouldn't mix color in black and white um, because nobody who's actually really good and has created a really good book. And he's... You know, he has really strong opinions, but he also is the blurb book guy. He knows sure. how photo books work. Um, he's like, it just doesn't happen. You don't see it. Um, the best of the best are going to be that and whatever. But with our cameras now, we can take really good straight in in camera black and white stuff. True. Um, yeah. Makes you think about contrast a little differently. Makes you think about other stuff. If you have really cheap, fast primes, you no longer have to worry about chromatic aberration. <laughs> uh, <laughs> there's, there's, there's a lot of pros to it. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I think that'd be fun. Yeah, so, let's uh, do it. I'll, I'll keep reminding stuff. I'll probably make a thing on, uh, our socials and stuff like that, but, uh, let's do a, um, photo share for the month of August. It'll be black and white. I'll have in the show notes linked in the description of the YouTube video, the email address in which you can send your f images. Um, but you should put I a link to Berta. About them. And I will put a link to Berta. That's a good idea. If you're really passionate about birds, um, you learn a lot. You'll know what's in your area. They have maps, hot maps and stuff about stuff. There's a lot of really cool tools. Um, yeah. And you, you don't really need to even photograph birds to get into birding. It's pretty awesome. You could just go outside and look up. Yep. Um, so you'd be surprised at how many birds are around you. Because I was like, yeah, there's like robins and freaking morning doves around me. And every single day, there's like 10 species of bird around my apartment. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so it's fun. Anyway, that's all I got for you. Uh, you know, feel free to follow David and I on our social media um, as we ramp up for the fall. Um, I'm going to be changing a lot of what I'm shooting. Um, going to be shooting a lot more going to be having a really good time but uh, you know do that if you're listening to this on a podcast please give us a review or just hit us up and tell us uh, you know what you wish your camera had that it doesn't um, yeah and if you're watching on YouTube and you feel like participating in this photo share thing of, in some way leave a comment sound off and let us know that you're in be cool yeah That'd be great. We will uh, yap at you next time, y'all. See you later. Bye-bye. Au revoir. <laughs>